So if you'll remember, if you'll remember, we looked at this square wave for a series last time. And so here you can see this approximation um, with however many terms, uh, five or six terms uh, compared to the actual square wave. And so what we looked at or, or what we noticed was that you can see these, these peaks here. And the fact that there, the, the, the general phenomena that whenever you have a jump discontinuity, like, like the, the blue line, the f of x is a jump discontinuity. And you approximate a function with a jump discontinuity with a Fourier, classical Fourier series. You're always going to get this overestimate and corresponding underestimate. Um, which is called the Gibbs phenomenon. And what wasn't completely clear to me at first blush last time was that, you know, this distance stays fixed no matter how large n is. You know, it, it's, it's like something like, um, well, we'll talk about what it is like exactly, but, but it's something like, like 0.89 times, um, times the, the distance in the, in the jump, something like that. But, but the fact that you always get this overestimate and underestimate, that's what has become known to be the Gibbs phenomenon. And so according to Wikipedia, this paper that I'm showing you was the first paper to discover it. So this was in 1848. So in 1848, you did not have Desmos uh, or any graphing software. Um, so this, so what had happened, I understand, is that in some previous papers, uh, someone had asserted that the values of the Fourier series approximation would always stay between negative one and one while you are you know, doing the approximations. And what the author of this paper is saying, what Mr. Wilbraham is saying is like, ha, huh, that's not true. Actually, you get these little bumps that 60 years later would become known as the Gibbs um, phenomenon. And so I guess, I don't know the story of, of Mr. Wilbraham, but it, it appears like he didn't have a PhD when he wrote this. It appears like he had a BA from Trinity College, Cambridge. Uh, so I don't know if he was a grad student or if at the time PhDs were just less common or whatever, but it's quite interesting and maybe inspiring for, for all of you that, that with an undergrad degree in mathematics, um, we're, we're publishing. So let's go through it. I, and I hope you've had the chance to, to read through it before, before the class, but, but even if not, we'll see what we can do. So Fourier in his treatise on heat. So this is the Fourier talking about the heat equation. I, I almost want to look up this treatise. So Fourier, after discussing the equation, y equals cosine x minus one third cosine three x plus one fifth cosine five x, um, and so on. So does this equation, is this equation familiar to you? And, and, and why is it familiar to you? It's a Fourier cosine. It's a Fourier cosine series for, for what? So you just had a homework assignment over the weekend. 
the right, right for the square wave, right? <laughs> so, so this is the Fourier um, cosine series for the square wave. Um, you just saw in Desmos the sine series. Um, I asked you to calculate the, the cosine series for for today. Uh, you can you can choose either one, and you'll get uh, a different approximating series. Um, so it says that if x is taken, is this pronounced abscissa and, and y for the ordinate? Just just means x is taken to be the x-axis and y is taken to be like the y-axis. So like, if you graph this equation, that's what he's saying. It will represent, so listen to this, it will represent a locus of composed, uh, locus composed of separate straight lines of which each is equal to pi parallel to the axis of x and at distance one fourth pi alternately above and below it joined by perpendiculars, which are themselves part of the locus of the equation. <laughs> what a mouthful. Um, so when you read that, do you immediately recognize that he's describing the square wave? Yeah. <laughs> yeah um, well, I think that they probably didn't have lots of, of Typesetting ability. Uh, so yeah, I, I didn't recognize it immediately as the square wave myself, but after thinking for a moment, like I realized that's what he's talking about. So some writers who've subsequently considered the equation have stated that the part of the lines, this is the shade, that the part of the lines perpendicular to the x-axis, which satisfies the equation, is contained between the limits plus minus negative fourth pi. But but it's not, it goes over, right? So the following calculation will show that those people who said that are, are wrong. So he's writing a paper and he's taking the time to tell you why he's writing the paper. Okay. It's kind of funny, you can see this question mark by whoever, you know, whoever's book they copied this from, which totally makes sense to me. So. Since the series is convergent, an even or odd number of terms will, in the limit, give the same result. That's completely clear, right? Really? I was totally confused by that. What, what, do, you, what do you feel like it means? What does it matter? Whether you're doing above or below. Um, well, so someone else said it doesn't go above or below, and he's saying that it does. Um, what I believe he's saying here is that if you take the partial sum with an even number of terms or the partial sum with an odd number of terms, it doesn't affect your approximation. Since the series converges, you'll still approach the same limit. Um, which is something that to modernize is just completely obvious and you wouldn't say it, but it's interesting that, that back then, you know, he pointed that out. What year is this now? 1848. I'd say in my case, it's less that it's obvious and more that I, I rarely have to think about it. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll tell you an example, if you would like to see, of a non-convergent a non-convergent series that, where the even and the odd partial sums give you different answers. So here's the classic thing to do that. So if you take 1 plus minus 1 plus 1 plus minus 1, then the even partial sums are, are zero, right? And the odd partial sums are equal to one. And this series, funny as it may seem, um, this series is, is uh, not convergent. Uh, the, a series is convergent if and only if the sequence of partial sums uh, has a limit. And if that sequence of partial sums has a limit, 
the, uh, the sum of the series is called that. However, uh, the partial sums here oscillate between 0 and 1. Therefore, the partial sums have no limit. Therefore, the series doesn't converge. He's saying what, like a, a contrapositive of that statement. Since the series converges, you can consider either one of the partial sums. Uh, and well, they won't they'll look at the same limit. So I infer that to be what he means. And again, I'm just telling you my opinions after like a couple hours of reading. I'm not like a history expert. Um, going on. And, and I hope that you like like the, the history tour. I think it's kind of cool to see people figuring things out for the first time and like explaining the results. Um, so let therefore uh, y equals this Fourier partial sum when here's the, where n is an infinitely great integer. <laughs> okay, so what's happening? Um, throughout this paper, we seem to be, I, I don't want to say that the author is confused about the definition of convergence. It's just the, the way that they talk about it with talking about infinitely great integer and infinitesimals. It, it seems bizarre to my modern feeling. Like nobody would say infinitely great integer anymore because there isn't, there isn't one. So I might prefer for me to write something like, like y sub n equals this partial sum and just work with the partial sum and then take the limit and then obtain y. Okay, but uh, anyway, fine. So um, take the derivative of y. Oh, and by the way, so why are we doing this? You're, you're wanting to calculate the y value of an infinite series. So you're wanting to prove that the Gibbs phenomenon is true. Uh, so like going back to Desmos, you take some partial sum. You want to roughly look at a look at a point, so you know, something like x equals one over n, and, and you want to show that near that point, the y values are definitely bigger than 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 in our scaling bigger than one, and with this particular sequence, it'd be like bigger than than pi over four. And so, how do you choose? How do you how do you show that? How do you actually find a formula for the y values? Like you're you're not going to have much luck adding up an infinite number of terms. So that's why he's looking now for a closed form expression of of y, and that's the key to making this paper work. He's going to express y as the integral of of something. And so you take dy dx or maybe more properly dy and dx, and you get, just by calculus, you know, minus sine, uh, then sine 3x, then, then minus sine 5x, so on and so forth. And uh, take n, whatever number you want, you know, n bigger than, than 1, and you'll get this series with, with, uh, however many terms. And then this is the thing that I asked about in the in the discord, right? Because I I asked if n is equal to two, can you prove sine of eight x over two cosine x is equal to minus sine plus sine three x plus sine or minus sine five x plus sine plus sine seven x. And actually, that's also something that, that Bill gave a hint about for the general case um, on, the, on the Google Classroom. And um, yeah, so how do you do it? It was like a little confusing to me at first, too. Um, one way to do it is to multiply both sides by two times cosine x and use the so-called uh, 
product to some formula that we've seen before. This is Bill's hint. So you use the product to some formula on every term and you're going to get a telescoping series. Um, the way I figured it out myself was, let's go to Wikipedia. <laughs> um, let's go to Wikipedia and look at their page on trigonometric identities. I'll share it in just one moment. It's going to be the same thing but just sort of stated a different, different way. There's this, there's this um, recursion formula due to Shebyshev. That I think you can, you can use. So let me, let me share this. Yeah, infinitely great could mean arbitrarily large, but because of the way he keeps using um, that language throughout the paper, uh, I, I just feel, to my eyes, there's confusion between partial sum and, and the limit in, in multiple places. And should the sign after sign for it? Sign 5x be a plus sign? I don't think so. So let's. Well, that's, that term would be n equals 7, right? n equals 7? Yeah, the term after sign 5x. That's like n equals two, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, n equals two. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. So here I'll share the Wait, let's let's figure out this this sign issue. So um but they do alternate. So it, so it would be minus, like it is, right? Negative sine plus sine three x minus sine five x. Oh, after, yeah, <laughs> yeah, after it's plus. I see. Yeah, that's just a little typo in the paper. Yeah, thank you. And if you look at this uh, Chebyshev recursive algorithm, you can apply it to, to sine, like sine nx. And I was able to use that algorithm to, to derive the formula. So I think you could, you know, you could do it by induction with this recursive formula, I believe. Are we all familiar with mathematical induction? Have you all seen this? Um, or you could do, you know, probably still induction or, or like, you know, product of some formula and try to get that telescoping formula. Wait, just, just, to, just to check. Yeah. Induction is where you guess the form of the end. Yeah, so um, induction, you want to prove a statement is true for all n. And so, for instance, you want to prove that um, that this statement is true for all n, that this, this partial sum is equal to sine 4nx over 2 cosine x. So you, you show it true for the base case, n equals 1. So in other words, you show that minus sine x plus 
sine 3x is equal to sine 4x over 2 cosine x, which, which you know, you do with, with either the Chebyshev recursion form of the, or with the product of some identity. And that's called your base case. And then you say, like, suppose the formula holds good. Suppose the formula is true for n. And then based on that, you want to prove that it's true for n plus 1. And those two steps together show that it's true for every n. So you would, you know, once you prove the base case, you would prove that, like, um, you'd look at the left-hand side, you know, with sine 4n plus 1 minus 1. And you'd like to operate on the 4n plus 1 minus 1 term to break it up into 4n minus 1 plus something else. Then, like, use your induction hypothesis that adding up to n would give you the right formula, the, you know, adding that one more term would give you like the n plus one. So I, I didn't work out all the details for the induction part, but you know, I, I would hope Chevy shows, um, you know, I, I proved it for like, for like n equals four or n equals five. And then I was like, okay, well, I know I can do this, <laughs> but but I hope that that general formula would still be good for maybe giving you an induction proof. Um, so even though you've discussed it, you can still get extra credit if you do it. Um, I think that the extra credit is now closed, yeah. but this could be like the homework assignment for for Wednesday. Okay. Yeah. Um, Well, yeah, I mean, I think there's like a reasonable amount of scaffolding and a reasonable number of details left out to ask you to prove it for the for the general case. Um, so then by fundamental theorem of calculus, you integrate the derivative and you get that um, y is equal to, to a constant plus, you know, one half times this integral. So this is going to give you a formula for y, but you have to figure out what's the what's the constant. So yeah, but this integral should really be from. I think it should be from like zero to x, right? Like you have to actually do a definite integral here. So like we're missing a symbol. Yeah. So <laughs> I think what he's doing is integrating from 0 to x, and then you plug in x equals 0 Wait, to what's, what is the, oh, I was going to ask what the one-half thing, but just pulled it out of the thing. Yeah, yeah, he's straight up just integrating with fundamental theorem of calculus. Straight, oh, yeah. straight up. It's a bit fired, or is it? Um, and so when you plug in x equals 0 to the left-hand side, to the series, see, look at this. Now he's taking a limit. So we should we should discuss this. So like um, it's it's really like I'll put this on the board. Uh, I'll go ahead and I'll stop sharing so you can see the board. But it's really, I think what you should really be saying is something like um, yn is equal to c plus this one half integral from 0 to x of sine 4nx. Like, I think we should be careful about when we're taking the limit and when we're not. Yeah, that's another mistake. Like you should, this <laughs> this value shouldn't be the same as that value, right? That's a common mistake people make. Um, so I think that this is the the statement that's really true. What if you see some n? Um, yeah, no, I guess it, I guess it would be. And then what you really do is you take y to be the limit. And goes to infinity of Cn plus one half.
PT. And assuming that the limit of the CNs exist, you'll get you know, CN plus, plus the limit of that. But, but now the, the point is that this limit is equal to the full Fourier series. At least that's what I, I believe this, this gentleman is arguing, just, just without mentioning the convergence issues, which, which he probably already knew it converged, so we, they didn't care to mention it. And so then he's going to calculate C by plugging in x equals 0, but not plugging in x equals 0 into the like, partial series. I'm plugging in x equals 0 into the, like, the full series. Is that legible on the boards? Easy. So it's like replacing the summation in a Fourier series with an integral, kind of? That's the goal, yeah. Yeah. Um, So that you could actually calculate. And so when when he does this, you can see that that I mean he makes the statement when x equals zero, y equals one minus one third plus one fifth, you know, forever and ever. And he and he's claiming that's equal to one fourth pi. So what he's doing is like, yes, the limit of the partial sums is equal to this integral we put on the board, but when he's plugging in, um, he's plugging in to this original y. But he's not plugging into the partial sum. He's plugging into the limit. And I know he's plugging into the limit because he made the conclusion that it's equal to, to one, four, one fourth pi, I think. Like, Isn't that based on the fact that we're like x of 0? Well, um, if you knew, I, I guess it's where you want to start the logic train, right? So, like, if you knew that it converged at x equals zero um, to that point, then yeah, that's totally true. Um, I don't know whether he knows that or not. So, like, <laughs> but but I'll show you an alternate way to show it, if you like. Um, yeah. So, but, but yeah, it's totally true that that you know if you have this general theorem that says the Fourier series converges pointwise, since it's a cosine series, instead of converging to zero, it'll actually converge to that to that constant. But like another thing you could do is um, notice that this is the same thing as plugging in one into the Taylor series for arc tangent. And yeah. <laughs> right? I would have seen that. Yeah. <laughs> Let me show you. Um, with the help of, of um, Wikipedia and uh, stuff. You know, yeah. like my two best friends does was in Wikipedia. Um, <laughs> This is uh, this is called the Leibniz formula for prime. But if you so from calculus two, um, you, I mean you learn how to take the derivative of, of arc tangent in calculus one, and it, and then in calculus two you use that to to find. Um, I mean, I'd be happy to, to talk about this, but, but I assume like you, you're probably familiar with, with finding some Taylor series for trig and inverse trig functions. If you find the Taylor series for arctangent of x, you can see it written here, arctan x equals like x minus x cubed over three and so on and so forth. So you plug in one into arctan of x and you get pi over four naturally because tangent pi over four is equal to one. Um, 
And then on the right hand side, you get this alternating series, which happens to be the same as plugging zero into the Fourier uh, cosine series. So that's one way to, to obtain that. But I don't, I don't know what's inside um, Mr. Wilbraham's mind. When, and, and this is quite common in, in papers, right? People will just sort of write things that quote unquote everybody knows. And, and it, it can be kind of frustrating to, to figure it out if you don't already know. That's why we have classes like this. OK, so um, then you get that he's going to write y equals 1 fourth pi plus 1 half you know, the integral. And, and again, I, I think he really means he's trying to have his cake and eat it too because he's showing you the partial sum. Um, so he's, he's writing down, he's writing down this, he's writing down y is equal to pi over four you know, plus, plus this. And that's the statement he wrote down. But here he's taken the limit. And here he hasn't. So that's the limit when x equals zero. That's the limit that determines this constant. Okay. So c is pi over 4. Okay. So c is the limit and goes to infinity of c n. And yes, you would calculate that simply by plugging in x equals zero into this integral. Because then the integral from zero to zero is, is, is zero, right? So the issue is not calculating that c is pi over four. c is pi over four. The issue is that properly, you know, this should be c n which we don't know, we didn't calculate. Or if you want to call this C, then probably you should take a limit there. But he doesn't want to take a limit there because then you've got this kind of, um, uh, it determined that form business or, or something like that. So what he's basically saying is, look, if N is arbitrarily large, then this number is like super close to pi over four. So close that I'm not even going to bother to put a squiggly equal. That's that's what's that's what's happening. So I think that's just the way people argued back then, and you have to kind of kind of read past it. Like I wouldn't, no, but but you wouldn't like say this person's a bad mathematician or something. It's just just because the way we use language is different than, than the way they did. It's actually kind of kind of cool. Let's go back and see it. Yeah, so make this substitution x equals um, 1 half pi minus u over 4n. So just write this substitution down, x equals 1 half pi minus u over 4n. And so that's telling you that, that what? x minus 1 half pi or one half pi minus x multiplied by 4n equals u. Um, so make the substitution, uh, just, just u substitution. And u substitution changes the, the bounds, right? So when x is equal to 0, u is equal to 2 over 2 times n? 2 to pi. 2 pi n. Yeah, that's, that's right. Um, Mm 
Where's the chat? I can't see the chat. Here it is. Yeah, that's right. So, so again, instead of using limits, um, um, you're you're making this transformation that gets you close to uh, the jump discontinuity. So you do this, and you do the direct substitution, and then you use the natural, you know, the trig identities. Cosine becomes minus sine u over four n, and then you you also pick up a minus sign by switching the order of integration. So that scans. You get a negative side of the sign. So the balance. Yeah, yeah, no, you're right, you're right, you're right. I misspoke. So this formula is 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 pretty good. So but it's still this amalgamation between, you know, like the limit um pi over four and like like in using using the n. And so now he's saying proof is left to the reader. It's, it's easily see that the only values of u which affect the value of the integral are those which make u over 4n um, very small. So in other words, like if you're taking u close to 0, then you're taking x close to pi over 2, which is um, which is right. So like if you fix u and take the limit, well, how am I going to, how am I going to say this? So I think because we're, um, because we're short on time, I'll, I'll just gloss over this the same way that he does. But, but remember that, um, Remember that the remember the Taylor series for sine x is x plus a higher order terms. And you know all those memes where like physicists think that sine x equals x. Um, this is kind of where we're going here. <laughs> so, um, and, and so when x is very small, uh, x becomes a reasonable approximation for, for sine x, right? L limit of sine x over x is equal to one as x goes to zero. So that's why he's saying that you can kind of replace uh, sine u over 4n with u over 4n. And then, you know, this quantity, 1 over 4n times sine u over 4n to the minus 1, um, in the limit as n goes to infinity, becomes u inverse. But he's not actually taking the limit. He's just taking n to be very large. So there's a lot of like implicit approximations, right? So Cn is approximated by 1 fourth pi. This integral is approximated by that integral when n is very large. That's the, that's the point. And that's not wrong to say. You, you, you do need some analysis to prove it. But it is wrong to say that, that y is literally, you know, equal to this. It's more like y is approximated by this when n is large. So um, when x differs by a finite quantity from 1 half pi, the lower as well as the upper limit is, is infinite. Again, when, what's happening for real? So when x differs by a finite quantity from 1 half pi, when you then take the limit, 
as n goes to infinity, the upper and lower limits will um, will become infinite, right? Because you've got I guess I've erased the the change of variables, but you've got you know you've got two n pi going to infinity as n goes to infinity, and you've got four n. Um, one half pi minus x. So x is different from one half pi by a definite amount. That that lower limit will go to go to um, negative infinity. So long as x was was bigger than than one half pi, but, but close to it. So he's talking about taking the limit. Um, and then the integral vanishes and you're just left with y equals one fourth pi, which you already knew. So this is sort of telling you that the Fourier series is converging to uh, point wise to one fourth pi. You fix an x first that's not equal to one half pi. And you take the limit. And the integral vanishes and you're left with, with one fourth pi. <laughs> but we're done with the hard part. So When x is exactly um, one half pi, and what was the relationship between x and u? So, yeah, when x is one half pi, then u is equal to zero. So when x is one half pi exactly, u is equal to zero, and the upper limit is four pi n, but then you take the limit. And this limit is known to be equal to, to 1 half pi. That's true. And in this case, y, y vanishes. So that's, that's fine. Um, so this is showing you the Fourier series converges to 0 at x equals 1 half pi. So when, however, um, 4n 1 half pi minus x is a finite quantity. So in other words, you need to take x to be such that the difference between x and 1 half pi is like 1 over n. So, so x is no longer a fixed point. x is like a moving target. So you're increasing x and decreasing um, so you're increasing n and decreasing x simultaneously in such a manner that um, that uh, one half pi minus x is like roughly one over n. You could even choose it exactly to be one over n, and it's fine. Then to each value of x will concern will, will correspond a certain value of y, and that's what you're going to prove is. Um, is bigger than pi over four just by calculating the integral. I think you could also do this just with the formula for y n and like plugging in x equals one over n. Um, so yeah, to do this, we'll just investigate the curve v equals sine u over u. In other words, just look at the integrand. And so in this intermediate case, you'll be integrating from like, like u1 to infinity. And he's just saying that's the area under the curve. Area begins at 0. You already knew it's 1 half pi. If the point from which it is reckoned <laughs> moved from 0 towards pi. So if you're just taking u equals u1 bigger than 0, area gradually decreases, right? Just sort of describing um, uh, 
Um, she's, just, she's sort of <laughs> describing what's happening. So, but, but I mean, I think we could actually plug this in analytically. Um, but, but his point is that if you want to look at how big or how small you are above this one fourth pi, you need to look at how big or how small this integral from u to infinity of sine u over u can get, because that's the part of the equation that tells you how big or how small you are from from your from your limit. So that's where the spikes come from. That's where the spikes come from. Like the top of the spike is basically um, the maximum. Um, of that integral. That's the point. So we're still looking at the derivative at this point? This is not a derivative. This is y. This is the Fourier cosine series. Right. But it's so meant to find the maximum. Oh, yeah. To actually calculate the maximum, which he doesn't do. Oh. Um, you could, you could like, find like a critical point of taking the derivative. That's not, that's not so bad. Or you could actually like go on Desmos and and plug it in. So let's look at Go back and, and look at it. So, um, so this x value, pi over twelve. This is that like value of x that's chosen, so that um, pi over two minus x is close to one over n. And when you increase n. Um, you'll see this x value creep closer and closer to zero as these spikes creep closer and closer to the left. And so to approximate the value of these spikes, um, you can plug into y sub n. So you can take the difference of y sub n and pi over 4, like for, with because we've got this scaling 4 over pi. Um, um, for us, you take the difference of y sub n and, and 1, and that gives you an approximation of that integral, for instance. So that integral is approximated to be. Um, the, the distance between the line and the. Yeah, which is approximately 0.18, like for, for n equals, you know, for n equals. Yeah, whatever n gives you sine of 11x, I guess. Um, but, but so, presumably, you should be able to do this integral. Like, like not do the integral, but, but like plug it into a computer. So find the appropriate bound for u1 to infinity, where, where x is like, over 12, for instance, and then calculate that integral, the answer that you should get is like pretty close to 0 0.181. So I'd kind of like to make that the exercise for, for Wednesday. So let's, let's see if we can formally Write that down. Um, maybe I'll ask you to find, like, choose three different large values of n, find the corresponding, find corresponding values of x and u that make the difference, like pi over 4 minus x, um, 
roughly one over n, you could even make it exactly one over n, then um, compare the value of like yn of x calculated with the Fourier cosine series with the integral, integral from u1 to in infinity sine u over u. Um, they should be similar. And so write a short conclusion about why the Gibbs phenomenon exists, you know, simply because, you know, this, this integral is, is there. So I, I put all that in the chat. Is that a reasonably clear exercise? So I feel like if we've been tracking the, you know, the paper, then we'll, then it shouldn't be too bad, you know, you, you, what's this relationship between u and x? Um, find a few values of n. You can actually use Desmos, something the author couldn't do. You can actually use Desmos to calculate these values of y n, and you can actually compare it to the integral expression that we got in the paper and see whether or not they're similar. And um, that should make us feel better about the conclusion of the paper, perhaps. Can I test what of this would be testable? So what do you think is like a learning objective from, from today? You know, I, I guess, uh, I guess this, formula for the sine series was pretty cool. Um, I guess realizing that y had an integral form was, was pretty cool. And some sort of bird's eye view of the fact that Gibbs phenomenon exists um, and, and kind of persists no matter how big you take n. Like to me, like the, the big important thing is that like as n gets large in that approximating series you get these you don't get that the tip of the of the peak shrinks down right you get instead the, the x values that the peak is located shift over um, and that's what you're that's what i'm trying to get you to see numerically with with this exercise like, like in some sense now, you wouldn't write this paper. You would just look at the Fourier series on Desmos and say, okay, well, you know, at, at this value of x, you've got that value of y. That's the Gibbs phenomenon. But, but it's kind of nice to go back in time and see someone discover this, like without the help of any software or anything like that. You know, just yourself and the pencil and paper and, People are arguing about whether it takes this value or that, and then you make, the, make this argument to show you always got this little peak um, coming from the fact that the sign u over u has this, this maximum. Uh, so, you know, I'm not asking you to be an expert on the paper, but, but I think like these kind of nifty couple of things that came out of it are, are, are worthwhile. Cool. Um, sorry for going into office hour time. I will stop the recording and let everybody go.